uh-oh, get ready, it's Duke Nukem time. Old Duke has been neglected so far on this channel. I streamed 3D once a long time ago, but besides that, he's been absent. On the website, we got guest writer Zach telling us about some good Duke levels, so there's some representation there, I suppose. It's about time I pay proper respects to the Duke. I'm going to showcase every Duke Nukem game that was released on PC, from the first game to, well, you know, forever. I haven't played these games recently, so it'd be nice to revisit them. Actually, I can't remember ever playing Manhattan. I want to say I have, but it's all a blur, man. Last time I played Forever was multiplayer with DBK, and that was fun. The good, well, only good part of Forever is its deathmatch mode. To cut down on length on what's already going to be a long video, I won't be covering 100% of each game. Far from it, actually. I'll be covering the basics and giving final recommendations. If there's a certain release you want me to dive deeper in, let me know. Think of this, again, as a showcase, not a deep dive. Lastly, let's talk about who made this video possible. Shout out to the Zoom platform. The Zoom platform is a digital video game marketplace. All the games they host are 100% DRM free. Any game you buy comes with an installer. You can play the entire catalog offline, no questions asked. They also don't have a client, so no need to download an app to access your library. There's a lot of cool and obscure games on here. I actually bought two games up to cover in the future. Two games that aren't found anywhere else. They currently have the perpetual rights to sell Duke Nukem 1, 2, Manhattan Project, and 3D Atomic. No forever, but honestly that's fine. I'm only throwing forever in this video to close out the PC series. It'd feel incomplete without it. So here's the deal with perpetual rights. If a game or a catalog changes ownership, Zoom's contract travels along with it. Therefore, as long as Zoom continues to pay the new rights holder, the agreement remains intact. Sometimes the original rights holder, while still selling the game's franchise, will hold on to the Zoom deal. So even though the game is now at a new firm, the Zoom release is sort of frozen in time. If that makes sense. This seems to happen a lot when Zoom converts the game first, except in notable cases like Killing Time, where Zoom converted it first, but from what I understand, it wasn't a typical Zoom arrangement. I think that's a shame too, because Zoom's Killing Time was originally vastly superior to Tomo and GOG's. That being said, the other versions seemed to eventually catch up years later and started to kind of look quite similar. You know, a little, a little too similar, you know? <laughs> This happened around when Tomo moved titles to Retroism, and later when the Prism Entertainment catalog, which was Zoom's original partner as a whole, got sold to Ziggurat. It's complicated. It can be kind of wild and confusing, but that's the gist. Let me tell you, retro PC gaming markets? Woohoo boy! Anyway, at the end of the day, Zoom is just kind of told who to pay. They don't have much control over who. However, that's kind of a big deal when talking about Duke, because God knows who will end up owning the franchise a few years down the line. I have all these games in some shape or form, but the cool people at Zoom gave me their versions so I could show off that they work perfectly fine in Windows 10. I had zero issues with the main stuff. I had problems on one of the 3D expansions, but more on that later. But yeah, that's Zoom. I'll leave a link in the description. I'm not sponsored or partnered with them at the time of this video. They just provided me copies for testing purposes. It won't alter my views because, hey, even though this video is like 95% positive, I'll still probably upset a few Duke fans. But anyway, that's Zoom. It's time to get started. Up first is Duke Nukem 1, the OG, the maiden voyage, the humble beginnings. Yeah, th this is it. <laughs> You're looking at the original Duke Nukem. There's no music, unfortunately, so I'm just going to throw UN Squadron for SNES in the background. There's no real cutscenes besides the occasional text exchange. Duke isn't the icon of hyper-masculinity yet. No ultra-egos or anything like that. The man doesn't even have sunglasses yet. Duke Nukem was developed and published by Apogee Software in 1991. Apogee was a titan in the industry back in the day, touting a huge catalog of games. The company was formed by Scott Miller with the help of George Burchard. If you don't know who these two are, I just... I don't know, there's so much history to explore, and I definitely won't be able to do it justice in this video, so I implore you to go further look into any developer or programmer I bring up. Except maybe one. Anyway, Scott Miller is credited as the one who invented the shareware model. This is where the first episode of a game would be freely distributed among players. Attached would be information on how to purchase additional content or fully register the product. Shareware was huge, and I love getting these compilations even though they tend to have some overlap. Some big names were in the shareware game, such as Doom. Duke Nukem 1's first episode was one of many shareware titles, and honestly, if you get a shareware CD from back in the day, there's a good chance Apogee will be all over it. Apogee is kind of set in stone when it comes to gaming history. It's impossible not to see them, and that's A-OK -okay because the majority of their games are amazing. George, oh George. George nowadays is best remembered for being the lead project manager for Duke Nukem Forever. Um, what an unfortunate legacy to leave behind. 
If you peek into the credits of Duke Nukem 1 or do even a little bit of research, you'll run into even more important names. Todd Replogle, the co-creator of Duke Nukem. Alan Bloom, who's done a ton of Duke stuff. He was part of the team that did World Tour, which I'm not sure if that's a positive thing or not. You got Jim Norwood, who kept busy, but I know him as the sadist who designed 1993's Biomenace, an extremely difficult side-scrolling shooter. There's just so many names I could go over, but again, I won't do it justice. I mean, dig hard enough and you'll find John Carmack peeking around the corner. Even his name is somewhat tied to Duke Nukem. Honestly, this is filler because what is there to say about the first Duke Nukem? Besides the famous story of Apogee temporarily changing Duke's name to avoid a lawsuit with Captain Planet. It's a fun story that often overshadows the game itself, and that's because Duke Nukem is very simple. It's a humble game. Early beginnings. This, of course, is DOS, which means Zoom version runs in DOSBox. These versions are pre-configured, so you shouldn't have to mess with cycles and other stuff. However, if you're familiar with DOSBox, you can still change stuff to your liking. This applies to the first three games we're going to cover. The graphics are that glorious 16-color EGA. Enemies and items are clearly defined, though there are a few things left to the imagination. The audio is... <laughs> well, take a listen. PC speaker sounds are just ear-shatteringly awesome. Everything blows up when you shoot it. On top of the enemies and random environmental hazards, there's just so much noise. Nothing like playing this at 2 a.m. in a pitch black room and all you hear is... ...while the room is flashing like a rave party. There is a score system, but eh, I really just try and finish the level. You'll find stuff like TVs, footballs, and whatever else that'll increase your score. The main villain, Dr. Proton, looks at you through cameras, so you get points for blinding him. No impact on the game itself, but it's a cool little detail, followed by a score reward. You have a health bar, and you can heal by finding items like chicken or cans of soda. Funny enough, if you shoot the canned soda, it'll spew and become unusable. It's gotten me in trouble a few times, it makes you develop a bit of a trigger discipline. The only other complexity is items. You got boots that make you jump higher, hands that let you grab certain surfaces, and a hook that lets you reach certain places. Then you can find upgrades to your gun to let you shoot more beams in a row before waiting. Lastly, you got keys. You gotta find open doors to progress the levels. That's kind of a DOS staple and it should be expected. And of course, there's the episodic boss fights. Lastly, there's the controls. The game's kind of clunky. The screen scrolls by shifting blocks instead of pixels, so it's somewhat choppy. You don't have that much control of your jumps either, which makes platforming difficult. Again, this is 1991, so it's somewhat excusable. You can shoot left and right, use items such as keys or grappling hooks at the right spots, use elevators, and yeah, that's well, that's, a, that's about it. It's a simple game that's pretty fun. Um, it starts out fun, at least. You see, the first episode's fairly easy for those used to the DOS world. It could be unforgiving at times, I suppose, but this mostly boils down to the level design. It's kind of all over the place. It ranges from insane platforming to maze-like corridors. Sometimes it's hard to figure out where to go, and there's a few leaps of faith you have to make. Regardless of the layout, you'll end up encountering situations where you take unavoidable damage. Mix this with the inability to duck, and you have little to no defense. It's a situation where you have to kill enemies as quick as possible. Boxes can have goodies in them, or they can have bombs that hurt you. During the madness of tons of enemies, this could be really hard to avoid. To top it all off, you can't save mid-level. So if you die, you'll be doing it all over again. You can only save in hallways that are in between the levels. For the uninitiated, this may seem very difficult. You may be like, what, you call this fairly easy? But this is stuff you can adjust to, stuff you can learn around. So yeah, I'd say the first episode's the easiest, despite some challenges you'll face. Episode 2 is where I begin to struggle. I said that the first episode can be unforgiving, but episode 2 is unforgiving. The first challenge is figuring out where you're supposed to go, and some layouts have one-way loops, meaning once you fall down a hole, you have to climb back up somewhere else. Items and power-ups don't carry over from the last episode, so you have to find these items again, which can be in some random corner of the level. Episode 2 was rough, man. It's what makes me go from appreciating what Duke Nukem 1 is to cursing it at every turn. Seeing those corridors where you can save and catch your breath is like those save rooms in the Resident Evil series. Episode 3? Uh, it's easier and a good closer to the game. I don't know, my memory is filled with Episode 2's toughest sections. It's a tough game, but not out of place for the time. Duke Nukem 1 is $2.99 on Zoom, and that's well worth exploring the origins of Duke. If you like a challenge and a fan of DOS platformers, I'd say check it out. Just be prepared for pain. I think it's time to move on to the second game. Uh, 
I am back. We got cutscenes. We got a soundtrack. We got a main menu where all the episodes are housed. We got major improvements. Duke is getting closer to the macho man we all know and love. He's shooting a smiley face on a target. He wrote a book about himself. He's getting there. No glasses yet, but don't worry. That's coming. Duke Nukem 2 came out in 1993, and the improvements are immediately noticeable. This is the DOS side-scrolling action you might be used to seeing. You can shoot up, you can shoot down, you can duck, you can climb ladders. There's additional weapons to pick up now, like the flamethrower. There's new items like the jetpack. Lots of tools of destruction and exploration. The sounds are meatier and not nearly as ear-damaging. The graphics are beautiful, as this is 256 color VGA. 1993 is during the height of DOS side-scrollers. You have previously mentioned Bio Menace, Halloween Harry or Alien Carnage, Monster Bash, and, uh, Scunny Back to the Forest. <laughs> well, you know, they, they can't all be winners. Anyway, Duke Nukem 2's controls are just so much smoother. You have a lot more control over your jumps. Everything is just slick and responsive. It's been roughly two years since the first game, and the time shows. This is an immediate improvement. The levels are pretty open-ended, but I didn't get lost as much as I did in one. The, the levels usually do a good job of showing you where to go, and the open-endedness is for more items and secrets. The enemy variety is also better. They all have their own movements and attacks. Keeps you on your toes, for sure. The game is still tough as nails, but it feels legitimate and not as cheap. Not nearly as many leaps of faith or sections where you're likely to take unavoidable damage. There's mid-level checkpoints, too, so if you die, you don't have to go as far back. But you can also now save your game mid-level. It seems more chaotic, but it's a more controllable chaos, if that makes sense. Now when I fail, it's because I suck at video games. But of course, what's new? This is one of those instances where I'd suggest playing the first game before this one. I mean, I know that sounds like a given, but if you play two before you play one, you won't enjoy one as much. So play one for a bit, rage at episode two, and then jump to the sequel. I appreciate Duke 1. I actually enjoy Duke 2. Duke Nukem 2 is also $2.99 on Zoom, and it's definitely worth it. Well, I guess it's time for Duke Nukem 3D. Do you want me to, like, age myself and also age some of my viewers? You want me to call some existential crises? Duke Nukem 3D came out in 1996, which is the year that I was born. So Duke Nukem 3D is the same age as me. How old or young do you feel? <laughs> old Duke Nukem 3D, where the Duke became what we all know. Sunglasses, the grin, the one-liners, tipping strippers, the works. Duke Nukem 3D is an amazing game. There's a reason why everyone loves it. It's a classic. But before we go into gameplay, let's talk about the Zoom version. Zoom sells the Atomic Edition, which means more content like a new weapon, an enemy, but also a whole new episode, The Birth. The Zoom version also has this launcher that organizes the game and all the DLC packs. It also has a space to easily change settings. This allows you to change the key bindings and it'll stick across all the games. See, this is still DOS, so making this easily accessible controls menu is amazing, and it's really nice. I really appreciate this. This is a great launcher. The expansions included are Nuclear Winter, Life's a Beach, Duke and DC, Duke Zone 2, and Penthouse Paradise. Most of these were made by Sunstorm, which is a company that has put out some wild stuff. I'll show bits and pieces of each of these expansions. I gotta be careful with Penthouse, though, because, well, it's that Penthouse. And, uh, yeah, you see, you see a lot. Anyway, all these expansions worked flawlessly except for Life's a Beach. It crashed a few times for me. But Zoom does state on the store page that you are buying this for the four main episodes. Everything else comes with no warranties. The expansions are considered free bonuses. Now, I'm sure the tech guys would help me out with this issue, but I'm not super worried about it. It was one, maybe two crashes, and that's not a big deal for me. Anyway, for $4.99 for the four episodes, it's well worth the price. The included DLC packs are a very welcome bonus. Let's do some small background before detailing why this game is a certified classic. First, to address the elephant in the room, Episode 4 has a few levels that were designed by Randy Pitchford. Yeah, the early days of Randy, the man, the myth, the never-ending controversy machine. The same Randy who said Aliens Colonial Marines was a 7 out of 10 kind of game. If I'm not mistaken, Duke Nukem 3D is the first game he worked on professionally. He was recruited by old George due to some custom levels he had posted online, so this video isn't just about the origins of Duke, apparently. We also got the origins of Randy Pitchford. Well, I guess video game origins. The man was a magician for a bit. <laughs> you know. There's more names that pop up in these credits. We got Lee Jackson and Robert Prince. I mean, these guys, come on! If you are a fan of video game OSTs, you should definitely know who these guys are. If you don't know their names, I know you've definitely heard their stuff. They did music for Rise of the Triad, 
And I mean, Robert Prince was the guy behind Doom's music, and of course, that's amazing and iconic. Their discography is awesome. Masterminds of video game music. If we put Tim Fallon with them, then we have the Holy Trinity. Too bad all three never got to work on the same project. Tim Fallon, if you don't know, is one of my favorite video game music producers. He did Silver Surfer, Pictionary NES, Time Tracks, and more. Had to mention him because, hey, we're on the subject, right? Duke Nukem 3D's music is fantastic and has been covered or parodied many times over the years. The music is stellar and definitely fitting. These two guys, they know what they were doing. Then you got the level-making machine Richard Level Lord Grey, who also did work on World Tour. And he did a lot of Duke 3D's levels. Him and Alan Bloom were the main two churning out levels till our old boy Randy came along. Last but most certainly not least, you got Ken Silverman. This guy is responsible for creating the build engine, which is what Duke Nukem runs on. We'll talk about this more when I go over the actual game, but the build engine is amazing. It does all kinds of trickery and stuff. I have to slap Ken just a tad bit though, because he's the one who did most of the work on Ken's Labyrinth, a 1993 first person shooter that's awful. AWFUL! So that's some of the titans of the industry. The point is, there's a lot of great people who worked on timeless games back in those days. I don't think you have any developer today with this kind of reputation and stardom. It's usually more infamy than anything else, like my good old pal David Cage. Alright, so what's the big hoopla about Duke 3D, you ask? Well, I'm going to break down why I like it, and hopefully it correlates with general consensus. One, Duke himself. Dang, those alien bastards are gonna pay for shooting up my ride. John St. John did a remarkable job with his voice lines. Some of the stuff that comes out of Duke's mouth is just normal speech, but when John St. John says it, it's all of a sudden hilarious and memorable. Duke stands out. He's not some generic soldier man. He has his own very recognizable personality and style. Two, the levels. There's so much detail and interactivity in these levels. Sure, there's some stinkers, but generally, there's a lot to explore and see. There's also plenty of great Easter eggs. Hollywood Holocaust gets a lot of praise, which, fair, it starts out with a bang. LA Meltdown in general is what majority of Duke players have played, and it's definitely a fun episode. It also does City Map really well in comparison to the horrible city levels of Doom 2. But I really love Episode 2. Most importantly, the Spaceport, which is the first mission, and Warp Factor, which is the third. They really sell the idea that you're in space with models outside the spaceship's glass and stuff and seeing the planet Earth is incredible. The whole episode's fantastic. It's one of the coolest looking space stations in a 90 game, barring flight sims. If Duke wasn't in Duke 3D, I think the game would still be Hall of Fame worthy. The levels are fantastic. Duke himself, mixed with the levels, is what propels this game into certified classic territory. Three, the build engine. The build engine's great. The explosions, the environmental damage, the previously mentioned interactivity. I do think blood showcases the capabilities better, but of course that came out a few years later. The build engine has all kinds of tricks that I'm not gonna try to explain because someone will definitely correct me. No, Elijah, it's not a teleporter. But yeah, there's staircases, elevators, swimming underwater. There's just so much verticality and freedom. It creates such a fun and memorable experience. I don't care that it's mostly smoke and mirrors. It works, and that's all that matters for me. The engine was improved later to use voxels and have true room over room capabilities, but this was after 3D's release. Even for an early version, the build engine's fantastic. I still think what they pulled off is impressive to this day. Those are the three major points for why Duke 3D is objectively amazing. It's a game everyone should play. Look, I'm a huge Duke 1 and 2 fanboy, and I think longtime viewers know this already about me. My complaints about Duke 3D are mostly a matter of taste, nostalgia, and I don't know, probably laziness. Also, I'm just a sucker for custom-made Doom wads. Anyway, the game is amazing, and, I mean, you need to go play it. It's great. And I would play this one over the World Tour version. Sure, it has a whole new episode, but the new voice lines sound like John St. John's falling asleep. There's just so much to Duke 3, and all I can say is please, if you haven't, play it soon. Now, time for Manhattan Project. I mentioned Sunstorm for doing the Duke 3D expansions, but they also did a full-fledged game. It came out in 2002, and there's some conflicting statements on whether or not this was supposed to be forever. Apparently George said that Duke Forever was going to go back to its roots as a platformer, but I don't know. Manhattan was released for a budget price, but I can't pinpoint how much that was. We got pipe bombs, like the same as they do in 3D. There's secret areas that need these pipe bombs to blow open cracks in the walls. You got a double jump, which is helpful during platforming. You can duck, switch between various weapons, and the levels are huge, having some interval doors that lead to other vast areas. Even being 2002, they're still key hunting, but whatever. This feels retro, so it'd be incomplete without some key hunting. The game's controls feel good, really good. The game performs well, even on modern hardware. 
It's a good game that's overshadowed by 3D and Forever. I think I'm going to do a full-length video on this one and flesh it out more, because i got a lot to talk about, like the opening cutscene that you can barely hear. But for now, let's just wrap this whole shebang up with Duke Forever. Uh, this game has been covered many times, and I'm not sure what else I could bring to the table. I mean, what do you want from me? I'd actually recommend watching CV11's video on this, because he does a good job pointing out how the humor is ultra-forced and massively outdated, even for the time. The script I had originally written was way too long and ranty about how the humor is just hot garbage. I'm going to concede that CV did this criticism much better than I can ever do, Okay, so DNF came out in 2011, which was 15 years of development hell. There's a lot of story and history to that, but essentially our friend George Broussard just wanted to try and keep up with other games. Every time a new game came out and was doing something new or groundbreaking, George wanted to add more features. A trap that John Romero fell in with Daikatana. Since 3D Realms was a tiny studio, they logistically couldn't keep up. Gearbox was approached for help, but Randy Pitchford and the gang didn't really do much except rush it out the door. What was released is, well, Duke Nukem Forever. My main two problems with DNF is the gameplay and humor. Duke, good to fucking see ya. I knew that retirement bullshit was just bullshit. Fuck that retirement shit. I just got back from helping my friend find his wife. Christ, what a fucking pussy. Graves wants me to help you jack these motherfuckers up, just like old fucking times. Can't wait to pound them in the cornhole. hoo -ah! Since I've already said Civvy covered the humor much better than I, and I 100% agree with his analysis, I'll stick with gameplay. I really don't want to talk about DNF for very long, so I'm going to be brief. Let's just compare the start of Duke 3D to Duke Nukem Forever. Damn. Those alien bastards are gonna pay for shooting up my ride. This is taking forever. Time to stop pissing around and get this big guy back into action. One is memorable. Gets the blood flowing. Right into the action. The other is boring. Even when you finally start the first fight, it's a tedious, tedious boss fight. It's a reference to the Cycloid Emperor fight from 3D, which is a mistake, because all it does is remind you that this has been done better. You can't sprint and shoot, the graphics are miserable, he takes so many hits and you have to wait for ammo to be dropped off, it's just plain mediocre. Is it the worst game ever made? No. I mean, it could be worse. It could be Mob Enforcer. God, I mentioned that game too much. It haunts me. However, DNF is boring. The pacing is all off, like in the beginning you're just walking around and occasionally stopping to do events that give ego boosts. The first combat sections were with throwing objects and fists. There's a stupid amount of turret sections that last forever. And this fell into the same trappings as other first person shooters at the time. And just has the same kind of tropes and it's like a cover shooter now and it's just, it's just, you know, it's, it, bleh. It's buggy. It's a mess. I mean, I guess if you get it for a dollar, you'll have less investment. And if everyone told you it's the worst thing ever, your expectations are really low. But I still don't understand how you could say that this is objectively good. For me, DNF is really depressing, especially when you play all these games in a row. I was prepared to be a lot less damning of the game, except to have a legacy fresh in my mind. Something a lot of people tend to forget, I think. That's all I'm going to say about DNF. It's a bad game. Awful. Not worth the price tag it's going for right now. 
uh, unless you get it massively on sale, and even then, I don't know if it's particularly worth it. Duke Nukem has a history-rich, fantastic, enjoyable legacy to explore and dive deep in. And again, I haven't touched any of the console games or the handheld games in this video, so there's a whole other realm of Duke Nukem games to explore. Now, you get a little stinky when you get to the handhelds and, you know, some of the... <laughs> you know, console releases, but the point is, is that Duke Nukem's been around forever, and while the end may be a rough one, if you want to say that Duke Nukem has ended, we still don't know if there's going to be more in the future or not. But let's pretend Forever, or World Tour, was the last Duke Nukem products we got that was new. And let's just agree for a second that Forever is garbage. Seeing Duke from where it began and where it ended is still a fun and enjoyable experience. It was really awesome to play each of these games in a row, one after another, and just see time unfold and history change, you know? It's pretty wild and pretty insane. And I'm glad I did this. I'm glad I paid respects to the Duke, because again, he's been neglected on the channel, and if I've talked about Half-Life, I've talked about Doom, I gotta talk about Duke Nukem, and of course there's other popular games that people have been wanting me to cover that I haven't covered yet that I need to eventually. All these games, with the exception of Forever, are on Zoom. And this is actually pretty fantastic, because like I said earlier, I have all these games in some shape or form. And by that I meant mainly digitally. See, 3D Realms had an anthology pack that you could buy on Steam, and it included a bunch of Apogee games and stuff. So I have all the Duke Nukem games, how they were originally released before the Gearbox takeover. Zoom has the contract that allows them to sell these games digitally on their platform. Which means that these games still live on on a digital marketplace. But you know, with all that in mind, just remember, Duke Nukem may save the world, but Jordan Freeman and co. saved Duke Nukem.